from St. Louis Public Radio. This is the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jason Rosenbaum. Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft has spent nearly eight years in his post, often making headlines for how he described ballot initiatives and for his opinions on election administration. Now the GOP statewide official, who used to live in St. Louis County, is running for governor, hoping to continue an emphatic electoral winning streak that began in 2016. This race, though, won't be a cakewalk as Ashcroft faces fierce competition from Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe and State Senator Bill Eigel. But Ashcroft contends that his record in office and a slew of policy ideas will allow him to prevail on August 6th. Ashcroft joins us now in studio. Secretary Ashcroft, welcome to the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. Thanks for having me back, Jason. I want to start off with this question from Lisa Langley on Threads. In a Sunday guest Springfield News Leader editorial, Ashcroft wrote, Republicans in Missouri have flourished over the past two decades. Unfortunately, Missouri has not. The GOP holds every statewide office and supermajorities in the House and Senate, yet our state continues to lag in economic and quality of life indicators, even as state government has doubled in size over the last seven years. Seems he is admitting failure by Republicans, so why should we vote for another one? Well, because I'm not like those individuals. I, I'm not one of the people that raised our gas tax 12 and a half cents when we had $2 billion that we didn't know what to do with. That was the lieutenant governor. I haven't been in the legislature doubling the size of our budget when I was claiming to believe in small government and allowing the people to make their own decisions. I've actually been con- moving conservative policy forward to increase the opportunity for all Missourians while my, well, my competitors have been selling Missouri for their own political and personal gain. So you have released a bunch of policy proposals called the Red Print, which I I believe I'm the only one running for governor that's actually released real policies. Yeah, but the Red Print is meant to be a play on blueprint, right? Because you're an engineer and you're trying to engineer the state in a better way than before, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, politicians fix the blame. Politicians fix the problem. We need an engineer leading this state that will actually fix the problems and elevate Missouri. So you alluded to this. Your red print calls for repealing a gas tax increase that passed in 2021. Intrigued by all things on Reddit asked, you've attacked Lieutenant Governor Kehoe for supporting a gas tax. This person claims that Donald Trump has supported a 25 cent national gas tax. Would you criticize the president? Similarly, and what would your solution be to adequately fund Missouri's roads and bridges? Well, I'm not the president of the United States. I'm focused on Missouri policy. And Missouri does not need a gas tax. Missouri, or at least the increase that was passed, the people of this state had voted down similar th- increases to transportation taxes, I think, three times over the last 10 years. They need a governor that will cut spending. The state of Missouri's budget has increased by, what, over $20 billion in the last six or seven years we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. We have a, govern, a, a government problem, and we need to let the people spend their money. Interestingly, on this show a couple of weeks ago, Lieutenant Governor Kehoe pointed out that your father, former auditor, attorney general, governor, U.S. senator, U.S. attorney general, and I guess grandfather to your kids as well, John Ashcroft, yes. supported a gas tax, albeit a smaller one, and actually said that it was one of the best things he ever did as governor. Um, is this an area where you disagree with your, your father? Um, honestly, I don't think my father agrees that we need a gas tax now. Um, I think it may be a newsflash to the lieutenant governor, but the world has changed in the last 40 years. And as I travel this state, even talking to people that are involved in roads, they would tell you that the gas tax has never fully funded our roads in the way that we need to do that. So the idea that we would continue to follow, follow a policy that has failed for decades Um, That's the definition of an insanity. I believe that roads, bridges, inland waterways, uh, support for education, and public safety are core responsibilities of government, and therefore we should pay for them out of general revenue. So in a video announcing your candidacy last year, you said, quote, career politicians have dug the swamp so deep they can't see out of it anymore. What What would you say to people who hear that and then are like, wait a second, why is the son of John Ashcroft talking about the swamp when, you know, you may be part of it, uh, from hereditary basis. Look, I understand that the, we're in that silly season of politics where the other side tries to attack and say, well, your family members in politics, therefore, 
I've only been in politics for eight years, really. Uh, I was an engineer. Uh, Ten, I if had, you count when you ran for Senate. I, I ran for Senate, wasn't successful. Uh, I've been a teacher. I've been an engineer. Uh, I've practiced law. Uh, th- those individuals that have been members of the swamp are just trying to project their own failings on me. It's what people do when they can't talk about their own records. Look at my record. I've actually cut my budget as Secretary of State and returned money to the state. I've refused to spend money and threaten the <laughs> the, the uh, Appropriations Committee when they tried to send me money and said, no, I won't spend it if you do it. Uh, we do have a swamp in Jefferson City. That's why they're against me. That's why every organization you can think of that makes a living with public money is against me because they know that I'm going to put the people first. Let's continue talking about public money. Dude, man, bro guy on Reddit asked. By the way, that's a that's a great name. Wouldn't is, you agree is, with that? Is, is, is that your account that you just, your anonymous account or is it? Yes. <laughs> My account on Reddit is called dude, man. No, it's actually called Jason Rosenbaum. I, I, I'm not anonymous. <laughs> You've committed to cutting taxes, presumably regardless of the economic environment. Will you commit to continuing to increase pay for the state workforce, not just targeted raises, but overall? And dude, man, bro guy goes on to say that there's been a lot of turnover. The amount of pay increases that were under the Parson administration have been, you know, helpful, but they haven't cupped up with inflation and it's led to a lot of turnover. Um, You know, there are a lot of people that have concerns about how do you pay for it? You know, big government liberals and big government Republicans. Our state budget has increased by $20 billion over the last seven years. Our state income tax, what it, it accounted for about $8.5 billion last year. $8.5 billion versus $20 billion. We can do what is necessary for government to do while returning the money back to the people of the state. I'm confident of that. About 10 other states have put their states on the path to having zero state income tax. It's past time Missouri do the same. And I'm going to put the people of the state first. What about, but to, to go back to the question, what about increasing pay for state workers? Like, I bring this up all the time. I've asked you about it before. Child abuse investigators at the Children's Division make $44,000 a year, which is almost $30,000 less than Illinois. And they're having trouble retaining people that make sure children aren't being abused or neglected. So, like, can you address that point? Yeah, the state of Missouri really hasn't had a governor that would do a reset of our departments and our salaries and our employment classifications. I think it was maybe the second year of Governor Jay Nixon that did that. You will definitely see that happen early on next year to look at what state government needs to be doing, who we need to have doing that, how do we make sure we have the right people doing that. But you cannot just have a bureaucracy that you allow to run on autopilot for 10 or 12 years. It's going to get bad, and we need to go back and see where exactly do we need people, how do we compensate them, and exactly who do we need and what skills do we need. You mentioned this, but you have called for eliminating Missouri's income tax. And you also said that you would have a group of people that would look into how to replace it. Yeah. How do you how do you do that without like increasing another tax like the sales well, tax? Well, or the once again, tax? I'm an engineer. It's simple math. The budget has increased by twenty billion dollars the last six or seven years. Mm-hmm. The state income tax is just over a third of that. Mm-hmm. We can do it. We're not going to do it on day one, going from our income tax to having zero income tax. We'll do that probably over six to eight years. There are. I don't know, eight or 10 other states that are doing it. All it takes is a leader. Look, we have too much governance in Missouri where it's uh, just doing what the people think you should do or just doing the least amount to keep people from getting in trouble. We need a leader that will show people that they can do better even than they realize and elevate the opportunity for all Missourians. So some of the states that don't have income taxes may have other sources of revenue, like Alaska has a lot of oil, Florida has a lot of tourism, um, and but they, some of those states may have higher property taxes or sales taxes. So how I understand look, look, your, Jason, I, I understand you that may like the idea of having high taxes. Mm, I don't. Okay. And and for the third time, let me say sure that the budget has increased by twenty billion dollars over the last six to seven years. No one in this state is going to say that they get twice as good a government now as they did before that. The Personal income tax accounts for about eight and a half billion. That's just barely a third of the increase. And frankly, when you talk about the states that don't have an income tax, there are several, almost 10 of them, that are putting their states on the process to have zero income tax. It can be done. The problem in Missouri is we've had political leadership that has refused to lead. 
and elevate this state. This is why our state is stagnating and the states around us are seeing better economic growth than we are. That's why we need a change in leadership. That's why we've got to drain the swamp. Before we go to break, wasn't the increase in the budget because of an infusion of like pandemic relief or federal money? There was some of that, but there's also been a massive increase of spending because the state has received more revenue otherwise. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be back shortly to continue this conversation with GOP gubernatorial hopeful Jay Ashcroft. This is the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back. This may be a first for the show, but we actually have a question from another Missouri political journalist, Joe McLean of Gray Television, wrote on my Instagram. Ashcroft was asked last year if he would be comfortable swearing an oath to the state constitution if that document enshrined abortion rights. He said at the time, I'd have to quit. No, uh, that's not what I said. And I, and actually, and, yeah, and I no, went, it's not what I said. Yeah. And if Joe would look at the audio, he would know that what he's saying is a mischaracterization. So I would like you to correct the record. On what that. I said was, I will swear an oath of office to the Constitution. I've done that many times in my life, and I will follow the Constitution. There are other people that have said in the past year that they would not be able to defend it. And I said, well, if you are not willing to do your job, you have to quit. Um, I have never said I quit. And unfortunately, that's just another, another example of Joe putting forth an inaccuracy. And I look, I invite him to go back. It was recorded. He can listen to the audio. Well, thank you for clarifying that. But I do actually want to ask you about what you would do as governor if that abortion initiative ends up passing, because we can go back and forth about what how expansive you think it is. But I think it's very clear that it is likely going to repeal a whole host of laws restricting abortion? It will repeal every law regarding abortion. The proponents of that in a court of law, when asked, could not name a single regulation designed to protect the health or welfare of a pregnant woman that would be allowed under that law. This law would allow abortion at any time from conception till the very last toenail of the baby leaves the birth canal. It would dis- it would disallow any regulations to protect the life or welfare of a mother that's undergoing an abortion. It would not even allow us to require someone performing an abortion to have the Boy Scout Red Cross merit badge, much less be a doctor. And it would prohibit any civil or criminal liability against a an individual that performs an abortion that maimed or killed a woman. This is anti-woman. So proponents of that would point to the language that says that it would allow the legislature to regulate abortion after fetal viability. But after they fetal do viability. not point to the language that then later takes away that ability. How, there how is language the in there that then says you can't get in the way of a woman getting an abortion. And that's why in court... They could not name a single regulation to protect the health or welfare of a mother that would survive. So are you saying that a, a doctor or a medical professional would potentially risk their license to provide an abortion uh, up to the could, moment of birth? I just find that hard to believe. They could lose their license. The, the, the amendment uh, uh, specifically provides that they cannot be civilly or criminally held liable for performing an abortion. There is no allegation that they would lose their license. It cannot be done under that constitutional amendment. Okay, so let's go back to the original question. If that passes, what are you going to be able to do as governor to restrict abortion in any way? I mean, you you could try to say, oh, I'm going to pretend this doesn't exist, but you you could try to pass laws that, you you know, could try to pass laws, but it would probably be declared unconstitutional eventually. In 1973, when the Supreme Court passed Roe v. Wade, there were a lot of people that said, that's the law of the land. There's nothing we can do about it. Thankfully, because over 50 years, people said, you know what? We're not going to give up. Millions of little children were saved, and I am always going to fight for life not just for the life of the child in the womb, but for the life of the woman that's pregnant and going through a difficult time so that she knows that whatever happens, she has the opportunity to have a successful and fulfilling life. 
One of the issues that's gained some traction in recent days is whether to provide state assistance for Kansas City to build stadiums for the Chiefs and the Royals. The Eichel's, answer is no. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. You, you short-circuited my, my question, but Eichel said he's opposed. Kehoe says Missouri should be at the table. Can you explain why you're a no? Well, there are two main reasons. Uh, the second one I'll get to I think is really uh, important to the people of St. Louis. One is it's wrong for me to take your money as the government and just provide it to someone else. That's not what I should be doing. Um, and that's what we'd be doing here. I believe, and number two, it doesn't work. Do you remember the St. Louis football Cardinals? Do you I, remember the St. Louis basketball team? I don't. Do you remember I, the St. Louis Rams? I know. I'm just saying. I, I was five and living in <laughs> Illinois when the Cardinals <laughs> left. And, but I do remember the Rams because I'm an award-winning sports reporter and I covered their relocation. But I knew you did. Um, but that's the point. It doesn't work. Um, you, you buy some time by taking people's money from them. That's not what you do. If you want a sports team to come or stay in your state, you have to make your state vibrant. You have to make your state an economic powerhouse where economic freedom reigns, where people want to live. You do that by protecting individuals with public safety. You do that by putting parents in charge of their children's education. And you do that by cutting red tape, cutting the gas tax, and cutting our state income tax. If we do that, we're going to be a state where the chiefs want to stay. Yeah, I'll just play devil's advocate. There could be people who want to keep both of the teams who would be like, this is going to cause the state to lose a lot of revenue. And it could be a blow to state pride if Kansas gets it. What do you have to say about that? If people want to keep the teams, they can donate to those teams themselves. It's not for me as a member of government or as the leader of this state as governor to take money out of your pocket and give it to a billionaire that wants to move their football stadium 10 miles. We have a more general question from Philip Kinder, who actually sent an email. This is the first for this. There's a lot of firsts for this show. No one has actually sent me an email until now. Will we see any compromises from Ashcroft in relation to Democrats in the state house or Senate, or will he plan to railroad or undermine any efforts they have to pass legislation that they may team up with Republicans on? You know, I've worked with Democrats in the legislature at times. We had an issue with our uh, safe at home program or address confidentiality program. And I was very happy to have Democrats that join me with that. Um, I've had Democrats that have helped me on what we're trying to do with education reform and what we're trying to do with public safety. For me, it's not about working with Republicans or Democrats. It's about identifying what is best for the people of this state and building a coalition to get it done and being a public servant to the citizens of this state. That's what I will do. That's what I've done as Secretary of State. And I've passed more legislation than any statewide official has in the last eight years. So like Igo and Kehoe, and I just want to make sure I'm accurately uh, getting your position right, you support putting a gubernatorial appointed board to oversee the St. Louis Police Department, correct? Well, I, I don't know if it's like them. I was the first one to call for that. I'm glad if they've joined my leadership in calling for that. But we cannot allow the city of St. Louis to refuse to support their police, to continue to defund them. We need to stand up for them and take care of them. Um, so that setup in Kansas City has not been a silver bullet to deal with crime. Why would you think that it would help with crime in St. Louis. Because it's gotten worse in St. Louis when we went away from it. Uh, I'm not saying that it will solve every problem, but what we have seen is that the, the elected leadership of the city of St. Louis has defunded police. They have put criminals above law-abiding citizens. It is the role of government to provide for public safety. Catch and release doesn't work at the border. It doesn't work in St. Louis. And we're going to put the citizens of this state ahead of the criminals. So, okay, number one, I think Mayor Jones would say that she gave uh, millions more dollars for police this year for salaries. But number two, St. Louis and St. Louis County passed sales taxes in 2017 that increased the money for both the St. Louis County and St. Louis police departments. How does that square with the idea that governmental leaders have defunded the police? Well, look at what they did with police vehicles. Uh, thank you very much for asking. Uh, when the state had control of the police, there was a, a, a facility for maintaining police vehicles, and then there was a facility for maintaining city vehicles. When the state left, they got rid of the facility for just maintaining the police vehicles and made the police vehicles go to the same facility that was used for maintaining the city vehicles. And lo and behold, if the mayor needs something done, if the comptroller needs something done, if the health department needs something done, that just 
happens to get done before the police vehicles are taken care of. We have police officers that are showing up for their shift. They don't even know if there will be a vehicle they can use to drive around and protect and serve. They, they, they may be in a vehicle where they see someone committing a crime. They need to get out, and they have to roll down the window and open the door from the outside because the door doesn't work. The door handle doesn't work from the inside. We have canine units, uh, individuals that have the can- that aren't getting reimbursed by the police department because the budget that was spent for this year had to be used for expenses from two years ago. Uh, look, politicians say all sorts of things, but if you actually meet and talk with officers on the beat, the people that are actually the tip of the spear to protect the people of the city of St. Louis, they can tell you horror stories. They told me one story about how they went to go get Um, an individual with a warrant in another state. They got to the airport to buy the plane ticket to bring that individual back, and the credit card, the city credit card, was declined. Hmm. The mayor can say all sorts of things, but I got to just tell you, it's what Ronald Reagan said about Democrats. They know so much that just isn't so. Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft is one of three major GOP contenders for governor. You can listen to Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe and State Senator Bill Eigel's Politically Speaking Hour interviews by going to stlpr.org. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. St. Louis Public Radio State House and Politics reporter Sarah Kellogg was listening into our interview with Jay Ashcroft, and she joins us now. Sarah, welcome to the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. Hi, Jason. Good to be back. What were your key takeaways from the interview? I think Ashcroft is absolutely pivoting towards more of what State Senator Bill Eigel is going for as far as an outsider, maybe drain the swamp angle with big points on the state budget and the gas tax and an outsider angle, which, you know, he is an elected state official. I know he said he's been in politics for eight years, but those eight years, those eight years aren't nothing. And I'd say the same for any of the three Republican candidates there. And so it'll be interesting, given his name, how much voters are going to, to buy into that. I was also really interested in his comments about the increased budget, which has been a sticking point um, and how Missouri is spending record amounts. And you correctly pointed out that some of that money absolutely came from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act and the CARES Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. And you have to factor in, you know, inflation and the fact that things are costing more. And that's something Parson has said. So it's interesting to see kind of his angle on that. Ashcroft and other Missouri Republicans have been arguing that the aforementioned amendment legalizing abortion is more expansive than advertised, which interestingly was a part of last night's debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And in response to Trump's comments that Democrats want to make abortion available at any time, Planned Parenthood's Twitter account wrote, that's literally not how abortion works. This disinformation about abortion is meant to confuse people and distract from what Trump and his allies really want to do, ban all abortions. What do you think about that? I think the language and discussion and debate on abortion from Republicans and Democrats and mainly Republicans on this particular point is just going to continue. And it it doesn't really matter whether or not like the the what the language says. I do want to go back to, however, the particular amendment that we're looking at. And I want to talk and I want to read kind of verbatim that section, which was um, that was discussed between you two, which was the General Assembly may enact laws that regulate the provision of abortion after fetal viability, provided that under no circumstance shall the government deny, interfere with, delay or otherwise restrict an abortion, then the good faith judgment of treating healthcare professional is needed to perfect, protect the life or physical or mental health of a pregnant person. And so, you know, it does have that exception. But listen, Republicans are going to interpret what they think that means. And Democrats are going to say that what that means. But I wanted to make sure that the language was clear there. And I wanted to make sure I read that aloud. So, OK, everybody knows that I'm not necessarily a firm believer in Missouri polling because it can be a roller coaster. But it is clear mm-hmm. that Ashcroft's lead in the public polls, which used to be really high, have, have narrowed. Um, do you think that he can hang on, especially amid an onslaught of ads from Kehoe and eventually uh, Eigel's campaign? I think that's a really good question. And, you know, I don't love to predict results ahead of the you know election, but I think being outspent doesn't mean that the campaign is over by any means, but it means that we may need to see some ads of his own here. I do think the name helps him honestly, undeniably, but also voters are smart and they can see how he's different from his father and they can see whether or not they like him more than they like Kehoe or Igel. On speaking of Eigel, how much do you think of a long-term threat Eigel is to Ashcroft? I mean, I think there's no real path for Eigel if Ashcroft remains like in the lead. But I could also see Eigel rocketing to the top if Ashcroft's standing declines. What do you think about that? 
I think the threat in this case is that these two, Eigel and Ashcroft, are widely aligned on a lot of issues, the stadium funding, the budget, the gas tax. And so then if you're looking at, you know, maybe then you're looking at personality, name, demeanor, and that's what you kind of have to go on when the policies are so similar or, 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 or background. And I do think they are weirdly each other's biggest threat in that way and that they most agree. And, and even though they most agree with Kehoe in the same, in some cases, he's politically an island and some people might align with that more. So I weirdly think that they both need each other, but also are each other's biggest enemy in that case. Today's episode was produced by Jason Rosenbaum. Audio engineering and sound design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts.